Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. It's wonderful to be with you again. This is the fourth session already of this uh, Revelation class. And so I guess we'll just dive in, huh? Come on now. There we go. Here's the stuff you see every week. Anybody need to, to memorize my email address yet? It's on the it's on the cards in the back of the room if you need it for any reason. But uh, let me know if you want to be on the distribution list. Um, all three of the previous recordings are up. The last two weeks took a little more time than usual. We apologize for that, but there are all three up there now. Um, and you folks at home, thank you for muting your uh, your computers. But if you have something to say, unmute those things and, and let fly. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, and I don't do a lecture. Although sometimes I rattle on and it's hard to get a word in edgewise, but um, please get my attention if you have any questions or if I've confused anything or you want some more information. Don't don't hesitate, please. OK. All right. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for bringing us together again as we gather around your word. Lord God, show us what you intend. We come before you time after time wondering what is it we're supposed to do? How is it we're supposed to live? How will we please our Lord as we approach that day when we come to you before your throne? Lord God, show us day by day what that is. Um, lead us with your spirit and uh, help us to be joyful in all that we do, pursuing your ends and your mission. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, here's a picture you've seen a few times before um john's depiction up at the the top and your right of of the heavenly realm and then down below the earthly realm uh, last time we talked about chapters two and three and that was all earthly realm we talked about those seven churches that existed on earth today we'll move up into heaven and talk about what the artist is trying to render in that rainbow bubble up there in the upper right so just to just a few words about what last, last time was like. Uh, chapters two and three inclusively had seven what appear to be letters, right? They're not really letters. They're prophetic pronouncements. I call them letters so I don't spit on John in the front row a lot with all those Ps. Um, but there, there are seven communiques. Now, never in history has any one of those been found without the other six attached. So they, they weren't separate letters. They were meant to be together as far as we can tell. Their setting is, as I said a moment ago, on earth, because we're talking to earthly churches and earthly peoples, although each one of these seven sections is intended for all of them, and in fact, all churches to, to hear and to learn from. Each one of the messages to the seven comes from the heavenly Christ, through an angel, through John, to them. Okay, but they all originate with Jesus. And there's a repeated pattern. And if you weren't here last time, there's a, a chart in the back of the room that shows how the seven lay out. And the reason the chart's so easy to do is because of this pattern. And you can see that if uh, you have your chart with you or, or if you look at it after the class. Each one at the end of their communique is told to hold fast, hold yeah. on, keep the faith, you know, stay with, stay with Jesus. Because they're all in the Roman Empire and facing some, some times of persecution. And those who conquer, and this is a word that, that John and, and uh, Revelation will use, those who conquer will be rewarded by Christ. And, and conquer is a military term, you may know. It means to overcome the adversary or overcome what's before you. And so if you have to overcome something that's difficult, that means there's a struggle ahead. It doesn't mean you have to have bombs and bullets or spears and and uh, arrows, but it does mean there will be a struggle in this earth on in the life that we're given. But those who hold on, those who hold fast, those who endure will receive rewards, not in the form of monetary rewards or property or those kinds of things in this life, but the churchy term for it is eschatological, in the life to come. When Jesus comes again, that's when the reward will be known for being faithful. Okay. Okay. So some of the themes that that 
came about in those chapters two and three last time that are going to be seen again and again is persecution and preparation for it because it's inevitable in John's teaching. It's what the people are going to face. There must be faithfulness to God above and before all else. Right? And, you got, and there's that hang on part again. Endure. No matter how bad it gets, stay with Christ. Don't ever give up. And the reign of Christ, that is, Christ's ascendance to be in, in control of all things is coming. And Caesar and the other petty kings will be of no consequence. So hold out for the time when Christ's reign arrives. And again, there will be rewards for the faithful. Not in this life always, not in the wallet, not in the portfolio, but in the life to come. Okay? Anybody have any questions about last time or anything roiling around inside of you you want to discuss before we move on? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. So going back to the point, like all the letters were together. So does that mean they, was there only one? That, no, there were seven that circulated, but they all had the same, they all had all of the letters on them. That's right. Okay. And so that number seven becomes crucial as, as John uses it again and again. Um, seven means all the churches. It doesn't literally mean that many, right? So it's all the churches, and there may have been many more churches, but all churches would have seen all seven of those letters. So they would see what a church that's getting congratulated looks like, and a church that's getting a swift kick in the pants looks like, and everything in between. And they can say, hmm, wonder where I am in that spectrum. Maybe I need to improve on this or accentuate the, the positive. Okay. Any others? Okay. Tonight, we're going to look at chapters four and five, um, and they're both heavenly scenes, uh, the same scene with an addition in chapter five that's significant. So what I'd like to do is read all of chapter four. It's not very long. It's uh, only about 11 verses, and we'll, we'll discuss it, and then we'll do the same with chapter five, okay? So chapter four, the first verse. After these things, after dealing with the letters, I looked... And there was a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, and the first voice was Christ's voice from last time. Right? Come up here so that I can show you what must happen after these things. Immediately I was in the spirit and a throne was standing in heaven with someone seated on it. And the one seated on it was like Jasper and Carnelian in appearance and a rainbow looking like it was made of emerald encircled the throne. In a circle around the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on those thrones were 24 elders. They were dressed in white clothing and had golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came out flashes of lightning and roaring and crashes of thunder. Seven flaming torches, which are the seven spirits of God, were burning in front of the throne. And in front of the throne was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. In the middle of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures, full of eyes, in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second creature like an ox, the third creature had a face like a man's, and the fourth creature looked like a flying, an eagle flying. Excuse me. Each one of the four living creatures had six wings and was full of eyes all around and inside. They never rest day or night saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the all-powerful or almighty. Anybody recognize those words? It is the hymn. Okay. The all-powerful who was and who is and who is still to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to the one who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders throw themselves to the ground before the one who sits on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. And they offer their crowns before his throne saying, you are worthy, our Lord God, to receive glory and honor and power since you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created. 
a lot of hymnody comes out of Revelation. You'll see some more as the night goes on. Okay. So, as I said, now the focus is in heaven. We're in the heavenly throne room, if you will, or throne area. And we see, we sort of see God on the throne. Anybody recognize the description of what God looks like? Yeah, that's curious, isn't it? And when we get to chapter five, we will see the lamb. I should have talked about this before I read. From here on, the, the imagery that John gives us is sometimes difficult to understand and, and interpret, right? And we're going we're gonna to bump into that, especially in chapter five. But mostly it's understandable, and some of it we still fumble with. So let your imagination roll. Maybe you have the key to something no one else has seen to this point, okay? So we read these 11 verses, and we hear at the beginning that a door to heaven is open. It's wide open. It's inviting. And in the, uh, in the ancient world, remember, there's a three-story universe. There's the earth in the middle story, heaven above, in the place that's called Sheol, or sometimes Hades, that's down below. And so to go from one level to another in the ancient understanding required a door as you went up or down. So that's very common language for this time 2,000 years ago, as they would think about their cosmology. So there's a door open where he can pass through, John can. And it's, it's clear for him, and it's clear for you. You can go too. But John can't climb up through there bodily. He, did you notice? He goes in the spirit. And he's not the only one in the New Testament who somehow comes into heaven in the spirit. Paul talks about going into what he calls the third heaven when he was in a spiritual state. He doesn't explain that. Paul doesn't. But John is very much in the same way. He's, You can say he's in a trance, but he's somehow in a spiritual state as opposed to a physical state when he goes up through this door, right? So in that spirit, that allows him to come up. That's a command issued by that same voice that was attached to the being that, that put his hand on him when he fell face down in the dirt and raised him up and gave him the seven letters. This is the Christ that's calling him up into heaven, okay? Now, John tries to describe what we what he saw there, and, and C.T.'s right. He doesn't really describe God on the throne, not, not in ways like Michelangelo with the older guy with a white beard and his finger sticking out and all that. That we recognize, right? He, he has difficulty um, describing any of this because his earthly language just doesn't fit. He's lost for words. He's stumbling. He's trying to figure it out. And so he uses some analogies that he can sort of hang on to from earth, gemstones and the like, right? So, but he avoids trying to describe God himself in any detail at all. None. No form, not male, not female, not human-like, none of that. It's just someone. Now we're going to hear in chapter five, he, this being on the throne has a right hand because he holds the scroll in it, right? And somebody pointed out to me on Sunday, well, you can say he sat. Mm, true. That doesn't make him human in form, right? My dog sits. <laughs> Not saying God's a dog. I didn't say that. But but that's that's about as close as you get to a description of the form of, of the one on the throne. He does describe him in, in terms of these precious or semi-precious stones. And jasper in the ancient world was a clear stone, and it came in various colors because they didn't just didn't give a name for every colored gem. But what this gives you the sense of is it's a clear one, not white, but clear, sort of diamond-like, maybe a diamond itself. And it sparkles and it flashes, right, when it's polished in the ancient world. And so this sense of the Lord on the throne is this sparkly, flashing, crystalline being in, in, in part. And that, that would convey something. In the ancient world, that sort of description would convey holiness and, and glory and, and amazing brilliance. Right? So you get that from this jasper that they use, and it's sparking and flashing. The carnelian is very different. Anybody know it? 
It says right there, it's red, right? Well, when you hold it in your hand, anybody ever hold, held a, a carnelian? I haven't either. But what I've read about it is it's red and it looks like there's smoldering embers of fire inside. Again, that flashing look, but it's a red flashing look. And this illustrates, it seems, another aspect of God that's very different from the one of, of the previous gem, the Jasper. It might be that burning wrath that God has for his enemy we call sin, right? So those two um, personifications of God exist simultaneously. And John just mushes them all together. He doesn't say top half and bottom half. He just says Jasper and Carnelian. It's all there together. And then he says something somewhat confusing to most of us. He said there's a rainbow-like emerald that surrounds the throne. And if you remember that picture I had up, it, it, the artist made it look more conventionally rainbow-like, right? Well, what color is an emerald? What color is a rainbow? Uh, well, emeralds? As far as I know, it's green. I mean, different shades of green. I, You know, so what's he trying to convey here? And one member of Sunday class stood up and said, you know what? It's it's great to have scientists in the classroom. He says, if you look at the spectrum of color in a rainbow, you know which one is in the center? <laughs> it's the green one. And nobody in my in the books I read, four of them, said anything about that. That came from one of one of your fellow members of the congregation. So, but rainbow, let's just take rain before we get to the emerald part, let's just take rainbow itself, right? We know if you were in the Exodus class or if you know the story of Noah, you know how important the rainbow was at the end of that. God made this covenant, this grand promise that never again will I end all human life. And to show you this promise, I'll put the bow in the sky, hence the rainbow. So there's this wonderful sign of promise of God that's encircling the throne with the rainbow. And that comes out of the Noah story, of course. And it also reminds us of how merciful God is, right? Um, how wicked the world was when God sent the flood. And still he was merciful enough to recreate the whole world with a new family that he gave the same command that he gave the first family. Be fruitful and multiply, right? Grand mercy and love for those who are faithful. But, of course, John... John would have known what a rainbow looks like, but he described it as emerald, right? And and the color green is a very soothing thing. Right? Why why is it most hospital rooms are painted a pale green? Why is it in, not too long ago uh, most medical people wore scrubs that were green? Now they're every color in the rainbow, literally. But um, it was just a very soothing thing. And if so, if you're facing the majesty and the power of God, eh, something that would provide a little soothing atmosphere would probably be helpful. And, and so it is, right? So what we have here is John has been exposed to the holiness and wrath in those gems, right? Or those gem descriptions that he gave us um, is now comforted by this sign of divine mercy that surrounds the throne. You know, as it says here, it overarches everything that God does. It's a it's an overall scene of being very placid, with very stable, very secure, versus the world that has been left behind. There's other. just chaos after chaos. This is otherworldly, to be sure, in the way it's described. And John doesn't end here. I mean, he does some other things that are very otherworldly too, right? Some of these other symbols that are present aren't as obvious to deal with as the gemstones and the rainbow. There are 24 elders, right? And they all have, they're dressed in white. They have golden crowns. Why 24? Numbers seem to be important to John. They're supposed to represent the churches on earth, correct? The churches on earth, perhaps. What do you think, well, Mary? The, um, uh, uh, um, explanation here that it said it is the number 24 is often understood to reflect the 12 tribes of Israel 
in the Old Testament right. and the 12 apostles in the New Testament. Right. That is the church tradition. But nowhere does John imply that. So over time, having held Revelation, we of the church have put that definition into our minds. And it's been with us a very, very long time. So it's the 12 and 12, New Testament, Old Testament. And John wouldn't have known anything about Testaments, right? They weren't even assembled yet. And most of the New Testament wasn't even written yet when John put this down. So, but that's the church's tradition. And, and we've read that in and we've preached that for a very long time. Okay. The 12 patriarchs, the sons of Jacob, and the 12 disciples of Jesus, right? So eh, symbolizes New and Old Testament. The, the church has read that in. John didn't announce it out. Okay. Okay. They're dressed in white. And they have those um, gold crowns on. Remember Jesus' description back in chapter two, he's dressed in white and he had a gold sash around his upper chest, right? That Jesus was dressed as a king. These people dressed similarly in terms of colors and confirmation, but the symbolism is their kingly priests. Okay. That's hence the crowns and, and uh, not the sash. Okay. So they're priests sur surrounding the thrones attendant to God. Right. What about the lightning and thunder that comes all around, all around the throne and the, and the roaring of, of uh, breaking rocks sort of. Does that remind you of anything? Anything Old Testament? Remember the commandments given on Sinai? How was it described when Moses went up on the mountain and all the people stood down and saw the lightning hitting and the mountain as if it's going to uh, blow up like a volcano or whatever? It's a very similar description of this tremendous amount of power and uh, and awe that the people have at the foot of that power, right? So God's presence and majesty is just overcoming or overwhelming. This is called a theophany. When God's presence comes near, things happen that aren't that are beyond natural. And that's what the the thunder, the lightning, and the and the roaring sound would would present to people. And then there's that sea of glass that's like crystal. It's, it's almost like a pavement leading from where John enters the scene all the way to the throne. It's not a, it's not a pond. It's not a brook or a creek. It's a sea of glass, right? It, it, anybody a Thor fan? And, and that crazy uh, entryway into, uh, gosh, I can't even remember the name of his, his father's Asgard. There you go. Yeah, there's this great big pavement of, of sort of crystal and flashing colors. It's it's almost like that. And I think they stole it from the Bible. You know, They stole most things from the Bible. You know, Superman is really a depiction of Jesus Christ. Yeah, it, it, true story. Anyway, I, I digress. Um, but you have this sea of crystal that is adding to that calm sense before the throne that's in itself is magnificent now reflected off of this crystal as John sand stands on the other side of the expanse of it. And there's that distance, right? How close do you want to get to God really with all of that power and, and might and uh, otherworldliness that you can't even comprehend? You know, in the Hebrew world of the Old Testament, if, if you laid eyes on God, zap, you were dead, right? So how close do you want to get? And this offers some space where you can take it in in a calm way, in a relaxing way, without frightening, being frightful for your life. So we get that sense of serenity given to us by the distance and this reflection as opposed to a direct look at the throne. Okay, And then there's my favorite, for reasons that will become obvious, right? These four living creatures that surround the throne, they're inside of those 24 priestly-like people. They're closer to the throne than those, right? Anybody want to meet one of those, right? If you go back and read through Ezekiel and Isaiah, 
you will find characteristics of the cherub, the cherubim and the seraphim. The cherubim are talked about a lot more in, in Ezekiel than the seraphim in Isaiah. In Isaiah, they're only mentioned in two verses and nowhere else. But the cherubim are, are all over the place. And when you see something end in an I am in Hebrew, that's, that's like an S on the end of a word in English. It means plural, right? So the cherubs, cherubs we think of in a certain way, right? They're chubby little angelly creatures and diapers that shoot arrows and sell things on TV or used to when we were kids, right? Um, no, not that way. Never described anything like that in the Bible's account at all. They are fearsome creatures. And so elements of the, the cherubs and seraphs um, are given to these four creatures. In order, they have the appearance of a lion, an ox, a human being, and a flying eagle. So think of it this way. The lion is the king of beasts or the most superior of all wild animals. The ox was thought to be the, the most dominant of the domestic animals. The human being is in a realm of its own of sorts, right? And the eagle was, of course, the most majestic and powerful of the winged creatures. Somehow they left out the fish. I don't know why. Fish would have no use for wings, I guess. <laughs> but that's, you know, those, that seems to be a message conveyed by the, some of the traits of these four around the throne. But if you take that, they're the noblest, strongest, wisest, and swiftest in creation in ancient thought. Okay. I'm not sure why the humans are the wisest. Sometimes I have my doubts. <laughs> But uh, that was the, the Hebrew thought long ago. And it says they're full of eyes. Now that's not, we don't take that, we can't take any of this literally. But what that means is they're constantly on guard. They're constantly watching. They, they have other roles as well around the throne as we will see. But they're constantly seeing. They're constantly aware of what? God's creation. Yeah, God's creation. So they're sort of the overlords of all things. They are mentioned again and again and again. This says 14 times in the, in the course of Revelation. We'll hear two of those 14 tonight. Okay. And they act as, they have a, a role. They're sort of the, the, not only the all-seeing, but they're the choir masters. When they give the signal, everybody falls down in worship. So they're, they're not just there to eat somebody near the throne. They have this leadership role in worship, which is the primary activity in heaven. I've told you all before, in my first call, I had a, uh, a worship service that went way too long. <laughs> right? And somebody tried to hang up a clock in the back of the sanctuary. And, and I, I went and I talked to my later golf partner. He wasn't at that point. I said, oh, we're just getting warmed up. Revelation says we worship forever. It was only an hour and 45 minutes. Hang in there. Anyway, here's, here's a picture from the 12th century. It's uh, in the British Library in London nowadays. But you can see these four characters um, depicted here. The human being, the uh, lion, the ox, and the eagle, right? Anybody know the tradition of who they came to symbolize later? Yes. Uh, most of them were labeled. That's Matthew. This is Mark. It's written in Latin. Marcus, Luke, and John. John the eagle. Johannes. That, that too wasn't the writer of Revelation's intent, but that became known. That became a tradition of the church. In my second church, I had a marble baptismal font. It was square on the sides, and it had um, panels with these four symbols, one on each side of the font going around, because the church had adopted them as the symbols of the four, four Gospels. Okay, so the four creatures and the 24 elders all sing this worshipful hymn that's recognizable to us. Holy, holy, holy. And it inspired that hymn. They also use this phrase, our Lord and our God, as part of that hymn they sing. Anybody understand the significance of that? 
right? Domitian, Caesar Domitian, required everybody to call him our Lord and God. And so what we have here is a very political statement as part of the hymn. Not you, Caesar, but Jesus Christ is our Lord and our God. So only God, only God is able to, is, is worthy to receive this kind of adoration, especially in the heavenly realm, but should be that way on earth as well. Okay. So that's, yes, CT. Is my understanding that the last time the word church is used in Revelation stops at chapter four? And the question is, why does the word church not appear in the remaining books? And some of what I've read said that the church itself, meaning Christ, ascended to heaven with the church. And what remains today is an organization called the church. <laughs> so I'm obviously you're not yeah. for, for you for you folks at home, uh, our, our brother here in, in the room was saying that uh he believes chapter four is the last time the word church appears. And, and so there's this sense that the church is that which has ascended with Christ. And what exists down here is something of an organization. Yeah. Did I get that? Yeah. And I haven't heard that said. I really haven't. Um, I, I look at the book of Acts. And immediately after Jesus' ascension in chapter two of Acts, the church is established. And Peter goes about, and then we have Paul going out and, and establishing churches wherever. Um, Revelation was written later than those, than the book of Acts. But still, I don't know. I don't know. I, I've, I've heard the opposite say. It just struck me as something I had not heard before. That no, I haven't. I've never heard that. I, I, I confess. I, I have to do some research and try to chase it down. Peter is the rock of the church. And the sure. Church went forward and Christ remains the high priest of the church. And I, I had sort of heard the opposite. While Jesus was on the earth, there was no need for a formal church. It was just Jesus and everyone who followed him. When he ascended, then there had to be a way to come together in the spirit and, and be the body of Christ. And that became the church. That's how I've been schooled. So anyhow, any other questions about chapter four? And we'll dive into chapter five now. I give you a hint as we read this. Chapter four was about the one on the throne. Something missing there, right? It's the presence of Christ, which we see in chapter five. Okay. Chapter five begins. Then I saw in the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne, a scroll written on the front and back and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a powerful angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, there's your three-story universe, right? Was able to open the scroll or look into it. So I began weeping bitterly because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered. Thus, he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw standing in the middle of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the middle of the elders, a lamb that appeared to have been killed. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne and when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders threw themselves to the ground before the lamb. Each of them had a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They were singing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were killed. And at the cost of your own blood, you have purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You have appointed them as a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels in a circle around the throne, as well as the living creatures and the elders. Their number was 10,000 times 10,000, thousands times thousands, all of whom were singing in a loud voice, 
Worthy is the lamb who was killed to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and praise. Anybody recognize that? Liturgical music's in here too. Then I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, in the sea, and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb be praise, honor, glory, and ruling power forever and ever. And the four living creatures were saying, Amen. And the elders threw themselves to the ground and worshipped. So two chapters full of worship imagery. Anybody have any thoughts or anything grab hold of you as we went through that chapter five? There's a lot there. I mean, there's just like three hours of stuff there, but you're not going to get it all tonight. Some of that's for your imagination in your own time, okay? Yeah, there's a good, there's one right there. So the scroll comes into view, and, and don't get hung up on the fact that the one on the throne holds the scroll in the right hand, right? And then a lamb takes it from him, and you know lambs have hooves, and how does that work? Don't get hung up on that. That's, that's cartoonish stuff, right? It's let your imagination go. The lamb takes possession of the scroll, right? The scroll is written both on the inside and the outside, which was fairly rare. It happened, but it was fairly rare in the modern or in the ancient world. And you can guess why. Scrolls were essentially made of animal skins, right? Vellum, as, as we call it as a general class. And writing on the what would be the inside of the animal skin was smooth and easy to write on. On the other side, it had to be dehaired and so on before you could use the other side in that fashion. So a lot more work, um, a lot more pricey. You know, to produce. How, and, and then there's the size of scrolls too, I should explain. A scroll could only be so long. I mean, consider what's written on there in, in biblical text. There were no chapter numbers. There were no verse numbers yet. That didn't come until the time of Luther, 1500 years or more later. So you had to unroll the scroll, scroll and find where it is you want to begin reading. So when it says, um, Jesus took the scroll of Isaiah and read it in the temple in his hometown. You had to be pretty skilled at finding out where in Isaiah you wanted to start when you unroll it. And then imagine, you know, going to a, having a bolt of cloth and it's 30 feet long and you, you're sorting through all of that. You got piles of cloth everywhere, right? And that's why they limited them to about 30 feet, what we would call 30 feet, because after that, it just became unreasonable. But this scroll is written front and back. And you get the sense it's a very, very weighty, very voluminous book because it's as big as a scroll could be and it's on front and back. So this is the scroll that was held by the one on the throne. Big stuff, big contents. And it's sealed again with that familiar number, seven seals. It is unbreakable. It is, it's impossible to see what is inside. It is completely sealed, perfectly sealed. And they're hidden from view, right? Now, here's what an ancient seal would have looked like. This was before John's time. This is about the year uh, 1000 BC. Um, and this was King Jeroboam uh, in Israel. This would have been his seal. Notice the shape. The lion, right? Which was used over and over again by the house of David in David's line. Well, that's right, the Lion of Judah. And so, you know, if, if Jesus would have had a seal, it probably would have looked like this, given his family line or something like that. In heaven, that, that's fanciful. But just to give you an idea of what seals would have looked like, and most in the ancient world were made out of uh, clay. It would have been a wet clay put in place that would have then hardened as it, as it uh, came in contact and, and dried over a short period of time. Later, they were made in wax, but there wasn't a lot of wax available in, in the time of 1000 BC. Beeswax, but not wax wax. The problem, there's a problem in heaven, though. The Lord is sitting on the throne. He, other hand, he has the throne in his right hand, and no one worthy can be found to open this, not in heaven or on earth. Why doesn't God open it? It's a question John leaves hanging there because the answer is soon found, right? 
Now, John is absolutely beside himself because he knows what the contents of this book are, generally speaking. This is God's will. This is God's description of how history plays out in its fullness. And it can't come about according to God's will and plan unless it's opened. We're stuck. It's awful. John weeps. Okay. And so one of the elders breaks the logjam. Says the Lion of Judah, the Root of David, again, hearkening back to that seal, um, is the one that has overcome all problems. Right? That one can open the scroll. That one can release the seven seals. Okay? And then appears a lamb that appears to have been slaughtered. And while some features of, of this artist's rendition um, are obvious to you, you see a bunch of eyes and a bunch of horns. We'll talk about that in a minute. Maybe not as obvious is, is, are the blood marks on this lamb. They're a little more subtle. But they exist around its neck there and uh, coming from its mouth and nose. So this is a lamb that has been bloodlet and sought, slaughtered, okay? But there it is, uh, just an artist's rendition. That's not what John expected to see. Oh, what happened? My computer just went dead, and I don't know why. Hello? Yeah, you know, the computer's working. It's just my screen went blank. <laughs> There's that possibility. But the people, I'm not sure what the folks at home are seeing. They're not seeing me, I guess. Maybe they are. Anybody at home able to communicate? Say hello. Oh, Everything is fine from here. Okay, thank you. I think I'm just about to repair it here. Give me a second. Okay, I'm back. And hopefully you're all back too. I have no idea why my screen went blank. I, I apologize. So John's expecting to see power and force, something big and daunting that's able to defeat all the enemies of faith that John perceives down on earth that's going to come down and set it all right. And he sees that or something like that, right? That lamb. A sacrificial animal, one that's gentle. Lambs are gentle. They're not aggressive. They certainly aren't a, a war horse sort of looking character. It's not at all what John was conditioned by his culture to go and look for. And of course, the messianic expe expectation was always of a grand warrior priest. And this, that doesn't look like that. But this, because of the announcement of who it is, is the way to God's victory for God's people, the slaughtered lamb. And the might of Christ, I just love this phrase, the might of Christ is the power of love, not the power of the sword. And John is floored by this, because this, this is present on the throne with God. And so John, you know, again, long, long before the doctrine of the Trinity, God is seeing two of the persons of God right there. There was also a mention of the seven torches right in front of the throne, right? That are the seven spirits or the complete and perfect spirit that God sends forth. I don't think John intended that to be Trinitarian, but it's all there on and at the throne at this point. So the Messiah is the one who has been sacrificed, the one who has acted as a lamb that takes himself, takes onto himself all the hurts of others. And if you've ever been to a Good Friday sermon, that's it, right? Every single time, because that's at the core of our faith. Easter can't happen if you don't pass through this. So the lamb, again, who's and all, takes the scroll from the right hand of the one on the throne, and now he's described. Seven horns, seven eyes. Anybody have uh, a thought as to how to describe or how to uh, interpret seven horns and seven eyes? Start with the eyes. It's the easier one. All-knowing, all-seeing. All-knowing, all-seeing. Perfect. How about the horns? 
all powerful. Yeah, because if you think about how horned animals establish dominance, it's by butting their horns against one another. And he's got seven, he's got an all encompassing number, right? Seven. I don't know if they're supposed to be spiky or big, but this one has seven, right? And again, don't don't take that literally. It's a way to describe exactly what, what CT and I were saying. This is an, an all-powerful and an all-seeing um, being, right? And again, seven horns, complete power, seven eyes, knows and sees all things. Yes, and Tom. so something to take into account still is this is still, he's still... Um, uh, kind of like out of his body, right? He's being brought up. Yes. And he's still trying to find a way to describe this. Yes. Because it's not, like you said, it's not literally what he's seeing. He's just trying to put words to what he's experiencing, essentially. Yes. Meaning, yeah, he might say seven horns, but he just has no other way to describe the horns or the eyes. What Dominic is saying is perfect and well said. He, John, we have to remember, is in the spirit. He's been in the spirit since the beginning of chapter four. He remains so. And so he describes what he sees on and about this throne in the best way he can using terms of earth, but he's seeing non-earthly things. And that applies to this vision of the lamb as well as all of the rest of it. Thank you. Okay. So the lamb opens the scroll. He begins to break the seals. And next time we will hear, hear the first six seals as they're broken. Right, the first four, or the or four of the six, or are, are the four horsemen of the apocalypse being released? We'll hear that all next time. But for now, he's going to open the scroll, and he's going to disclose to all of heaven and earth what the scroll has within it. That means that God's plan for all of creation is going to play out as this Lamb figure opens the scroll. That plan is not in any way changed by the lamb's opening of it. The lamb doesn't alter anything. He just simply lets it loose. God's plan is now executed according to God's plan. He is the agent by which it is realized. Okay? And what that scroll releases is, is something that is forever. And it is unchangeable. Right? It is of God. The plan, the words of the plan are of God. God is God's word. So the lamb is obedient. He's obedient in the opening of the scroll and releasing its contents without altering it. And we knew that because he was already obedient even unto death. We know this now to be the Christ figure. And John will use that all the way through Revelation with this lamb. And when that scroll, when the seals are broken, worship breaks out. Right, and we come to the great Amen, which I shouldn't have mentioned yet. One of the things that happens in worship that was really fast as we went through it is we hear that those twenty-four elders had these bowls of incense, right, and they were holding those out, and that's the first hint that heaven and earth come together. All the saints of heaven and earth, of all times and all places, right. And what that, what that incense will symbolize, as, as it did in ancient Hebrew, are prayers being raised up to God. So the prayers of earth are being held by those 24, being raised up around the throne. The prayers of earth are being heard in this worship scene as worship goes on. The people's prayers are present there, even during the worship. How powerful is that? You know, your prayers aren't wasted down here. They're like incense in heaven, and God takes it all in. And incense was a, a very thought to be a, a wonderful, sweet smell for God. Let me go off track a little bit. Anybody know why the ancient temple and now modern Roman Catholics, and, and occasionally, not very often, Lutheran churches will have incense in them? Well, in, in the ancient world, animal sacrifices were a big part of worship, right? When you sacrifice an animal and everybody's crowded around, sometimes that's not a very lovely smell. And the incense does cover that up, <laughs> but it had other symbolic meanings as well. Okay. 
So those bowls of incense are presented. The prayers of the people are at the throne. And uh, all the saints on earth and in heaven are joining together in this grand scene of worship. And there's an uncountable thousands upon thousands or, or 10,000 times 10,000, meaning almost literally an infinite number of angels around that take up something called this new song. And the new doesn't mean, well, he just composed it. What it means is something never experienced before has come to be. It's a new creation. The lamb realizing his final mission is ushering in the new creation, the new world. Right? Yep. That's what's being symbolized here with this new song. It's, you know, again, something that this, this scroll has the entire plan that God had for not only heaven and Christ's role, but for what the world was to be. Yes. And then, and so when you say, why does God let all this happen? Nobody necessarily has an answer, but it symbolically, at least, it's all written down in this scroll. So presumably you could look back through the entire history of the world and say, well, you guys messed up, you messed up. And I said, you could never figure it out, could you guys? Okay, here's the answer. For those of you at home, uh, CT is pointing out, of course, that this scroll creates all of God's plan. And yet the humans on earth could never figure this out going forward. Um, we, we never dis uh, perceived God's plan because we had our own plans, right? Hang on to that thought because that you, you anticipate where I'm going. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. That's good. That's good. So John hears this new song. It's ringing in his ears. And, and now he's in the spirit, as, as Dominic points out. He can go back and be bodily on earth again and, and endure with confidence. He knows the lamb has opened the seals and all will be well eventually. Despite whatever caesar and neighbors and whatever could unloose on on uh on his life it will be all right and so john's purpose in writing all of this is to give hope a sense of christ's victory um, as we go forward to all the other people on earth like us who read it now and and that will carry us through the struggles that we will all have okay Okay, before I get into some pontificating, anybody have some thoughts, questions about chapter five? Anything catch your eyes that I didn't hit? Okay. So John's vision of that throne is, as Dominic pointed out, is just undescribable with our earthly words. It's beyond us, transcendent. God is not like that in creation right? God created all there is. Therefore, God can't be like he created. He must be above and beyond that, above and beyond our comprehension. There's another point that these two chapters make. Those who have faith worship. They come together in worship. They don't go off in caves all by themselves. Worship is central in what the gathering community does to feed one another, to build one another up, and to uh, console one another when that's needed as well. More about that later. Worship isn't something you do once in a while or when you think about it or you add it on after your busy day. It's the first thing you do in John's teaching. It's the central element of heaven. Why isn't it the central element of your life, says John? Worship is that important. It's at the heart of what we do as God's people. And that throne room, therefore, is a worship setting completely. It's all ring upon ring of choirs around the throne. And that's where most of Revelation takes place. Something's going to happen with a scroll and then something happens on earth. But it initiates from heaven and goes toward earth. Right? Handles Messiah comes out of bits of Revelation, including some of the chapters we've just read. The Alleluia Chorus comes from this very, very uh, descriptive throne scene. Okay, But no, notice worship isn't always one tone. 
Worship isn't always thanksgiving and praise. It usually is, right? Most of the time it is. When we come on Sunday, we intend it to be that way most Sundays. All Saints Sundays may be a little different. Um, there are times, 22 years and three days ago, right? September 11th, 2001, people flocked to churches and they weren't looking to do adoration and praise that day. They were dealing with anguish and despair and, and the like. And, and some were doubting whether the world was sustainable if God was still with us. That happens at funerals as well for many of us and, and other occasions. So there are different moods, but the majority are praise and thanksgiving. And again, something I said already, John sees worship as a political act. Let's keep politics out of my worship, right? Well, if you declare your allegiance to the Lord God first, you're saying something political. You're saying, not Caesar, thank you very much, but, but the one on the throne and the lamb. That's a political statement. And every time we meet, every time we come together, every time you say the creed, you're making that political statement of who your Lord is, who the most important uh, entity in life is for you. And God says, or John says, God deserves that. Who's superior to God? Who is it that commands God? Right. Another point. The image of God on that throne with the scroll is one to hold on to, right? God rules the world. And all that is to come, it's all laid out. It's all laid out on that scroll. He's in control. His control isn't like human control, however. And that fact that God's in charge of all this and in control ought to give us comfort. Because Lord knows how, how the world would turn out if we gave some other some human being the, the power to control everything from now to the end. Probably wouldn't turn out well. Almost surely wouldn't turn out well. Oh, yes. That's John's perspective. What about today? Is God still in control? I mean, we've gone through the Holocaust. Well, some of us were alive then, some of us not. The Holocaust is within memory, right? We've gone, uh, we have memory or at least experience of two world wars, um, um, use of atomic weapons, um, all kinds of other wars since, and atrocities around the world. Why didn't God stop those things? If he's in control, why not squash the bad humans that are acting so badly? And, and so the question is, is God still ruling and in control today? What do we understand about tragedy and disease, COVID among others, or cancer for that matter, or the violence of what we've come to understand as normal? Right? Where's God in that? I used to go in a deployed unit to prepare for what some call Armageddon, the exchange of nuclear weapons between the old Soviet Union and the United States. And, and ours was the command center that controlled those things for the United States and tried to survive the nation. That was our, our role. And I was, the, I was in a group that provided all the communications for them to do that stuff. I wasn't a decision maker at the table, but I, was, I had all the stuff around them. Where's God in that? My roommate was the chaplain. We talked about that way into the night. John absolutely rejects this idea that God is holding everybody by puppet strings, like a marionette. That's deterministic, right? That God pulls the string and your arm goes up or you make the decision this way. That's not the way God operates. That's the way we would if we had the power. But that's not the way God is. And we call, that's, you know, we talk about providence. God provides what is needed, right? But God's providence doesn't pull the strings. We don't live out some sort of script that God has, has pre-written. The scroll exists, but it's not a script that everybody dances to or sings to. Instead, God, John teaches that uh, this providence, which God provides, 
respects human freedom at the same time as the scroll plays out. So you're free to make your decisions. You're free to do evil. You're free to do good, right? And God knows that. Now remember, God's not bounded by time, so he already knows what you're going to choose, and he knows how that's going to play out. But God doesn't control that. Sometimes in this life, human evil is just too much to take, right? We can all point to examples of that. There's no doubt about it. But still, and, and John lived in a time that could be described as very much the same. You know, evil was always around the corner. But now John, with this vision of the throne room, is confident that God's purposes are going to be worked out in the world as his scroll is unf unfurled, but not in this controlling deterministic fashion, in a way that we can't comprehend. And in the end, evil will be gone. John is sure of it. And the rest of the book is going to show you how evil is defeated. Okay. He sees all of this in the spirit, as Dominic pointed out correctly. And so he sees through eyes of faith. When he comes back to the earth bodily, he can't, he can't describe that to anyone else except he has it upon faith that God will do all these things. Your human freedom is not overridden by the lamb or the one on the throne. He doesn't remove all of those difficulties and all those cancers and all those other things that afflict us in this life. He doesn't. He works through them. Also, he doesn't coerce you to doing things his way. This weekend, there were a bunch of carrots back there that somebody brought in looking for a, a good home to give them away to. And I couldn't resist, you know, the carrot and a stick sort of thing. God doesn't behave that way. God doesn't have it in his mind to do that. He wants you to love him enough where you will follow him as opposed to giving you goodies if you do things his way. So there's no coercion. And despite our failures, and we all have them, and despite sometimes our ability to push away and say no, the entire universe is going to go to its appointed end according to that scroll that two-sided scroll. So in spite of that which we all suffer, no matter what age we live in, in spite of what earthly kings and potentates might do with their oppression and persecution, worship and singing still breaks out in heaven. Shouldn't it break out here too? That's why we come on Sundays, right? We're not in the world. We're just of the world. Any problems or any rotten vegetables you wish to throw? Okay. I'll have time. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're rotting your vegetable in the back row back there? All righty. Next time, and it, it won't be, the, I'll talk about the schedule in a moment. It won't be this coming week. It'll be two weeks. Uh, take a look at chapter six. Um, it will unfurl six of the seven seals as we get together. And, and I ask you again, must, as we talked about some in this case, it must worship always be glorious and beautiful. You know, with the four horsemen coming, we get the answer to that, right? And, and should we make room? Is, is it, should we be intentional about making room for gathering together and sharing our griefs? It's called lament, right? like the, some of the psalmists are, are written expressly for that purpose. You know, should we do that? Should we have a worship service specifically scheduled to do that? There are some that, that do that um, the night before New Year's Eve and get together and instead of burning Zozobra or whatever, we, we offer our laments and our prayers um, for our griefs. Here's something to think about as you read chapter six, right? Um, that you'll see the martyrs under the altar and you'll hear the words that inspired under the shadow of thy throne, thy saints have dwelt secure, sufficient is thy arm alone and our defense is sure. 
comes from our, oh God, our, our help in ages past. That's you know, chapter and, and verse two. And you don't hear me singing that for a reason. I like you all too much. You don't ever want to hear my singing. Okay. Um, next week, we won't have class. It's because I have a preaching assignment. So it's, we're sort of on an every other schedule for the next four weeks. As you can see, um, in very early October, I'll be in the St. Louis area because the LCMC uh, annual gathering of congregations is there and I'm to represent us. So that's why I'm missing the, the October 1st and October 4th classes. So I'll, every other week. And then after, once we get to October 8th, uh, we won't miss a class until Thanksgiving. So we'll, we'll just go right on through. And I was able to put that up on the website now. So all the classes actually all the way through December are on the website. So you can see Sunday and Wednesday classes. Okay. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, we do live in a world where troubles exist, where griefs are among us where threats are sometimes uh, put upon our heads. But Lord God, Jesus Christ knows all these things, sees all these things, and has the power to defeat all these things and is doing so. So Lord God, let us hold that hope and that promise in our hearts. Let us bring that understanding to our worship and let us, and in the glory of the throne room, all raise our voices with those in the heavenly place with the grand amen, it is all done. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Welcome to Go in Peace and Serve the Lord.